Radio Raheem here with none other than Michael Buffer in Cardiff, Wales. Uh, we get we get to travel quite a bit, find you in many different places, sir. Always the most dapper gentleman, no matter what continent or what the uh, the posh setting. You've always set the standard. Oh well, thank you very much, Radio Raheem. It's uh, lovely to be here in England. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> One thing that I have to mention, because today uh, we went through a process that it was a little tongue-in-cheek, we were having fun with it, but there was some really um, significant knowledge imparted to me during that time, not just how to be an announcer, but how, what you go through as an announcer, so it piqued my interest, actually, in talking a little bit inside of all these fights that we're always, you know, who's up, who's down, who's going to win, who's looking good, we're going to get to all of that, but... Uh, you and I, uh, being personal friends, I know the kind of travel and commitment that you put into your profession. And we're here looking at elite fighters who have to put in the same kind of work and focus and concentration on their craft. If I could ask, how would you like it? than we do, especially when it's demanding physically for them. But it, yeah, but there's longevity in what you do. And there's a certain, uh, you know, they can miss a shot. They can miss a punch. They can miss a step. They can even get knocked down and come back up. Part of your thing is that, you know, it, it's almost always perfect. And how does that inform your profession, the way you see these fighters perform theirs? Well, one thing you said that's key there, it's, it's almost perfect isn't perfect. And I am my own worst critic, and I, you know, I'll, I'll watch uh, a replay, and I'm always saying like, no, I want to do this better, do that better. I think that's, and I'm sure you do the same thing, and uh, I think that's that's part of what uh, you try to achieve is professionalism, and uh, and at the same time, enjoy myself as a fan. I think that's really important with what I do. One guy that the fans absolutely enjoy and have proven so with their dollars their time their travel their attention even at home they buy these this guy's fights uh, you know worldwide but certainly here uh, on this side of the pond is anthony joshua he's shown a resilience an ability to get off that canvas and get back up and fight has there been a moment in your career where you felt down or something happened that you felt like you had to overcome and maybe, maybe just in your mind, because you're your biggest critic, like everything hung in the balance and you had to come back and, and prove even to yourself that you are who you believe you to be. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, once again, uh, almost perfect isn't perfect. Nobody's perfect. And it was just recently, a couple months ago, I gave the announcement of a fight. I, you were there. And we were in the Carson, uh, oh, yeah, in California. Sure. Yeah. And um, I just had what we call a brain fart. And I introduce the right first name, but the wrong last name of a fight in a, uh, in a decision. And uh, there were quite a few boos. And, you know, you got to come back from that. That's for sure. But it happens. You know, I'm human. OK, so in that moment, let's say that's a fighter getting knocked down, right? They say, you know, stay down, collect yourself, climb back into it, get your, get your footing back. It what goes gets eight and stand back <laughs> up, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So what goes through your mind once you realize, OK, it's been said, you can't grab those words yeah. back. What goes through your mind, not so that you could correct that last mistake, but that it doesn't hang in your mind and then you start making future mistakes. Yeah. What's the process? Uh, just go at least that was the first fight i had another one to do after that and just try to really knock it out of the park and at the same time just seem as though nothing happened which is that's all you can do you just have to go on like aj gets knocked down he had to get back up against vladimir klitschko collect himself and act as though it didn't happen and do his best so that you know that's what i do you talk about the physical rigors of being a boxer. Obviously, there are a few things that you could do as a profession that, are, that could match the kind of uh, demands one puts on his body if he's a professional fighter, you know, even MMA, boxing, either way. But what about the kind of physical demand that you put on your body and your mind to perform not just at the level that you do, <clears throat> but with the frequency that you do? on the many stages that you find yourself uh, throughout the world? Yeah, I think the most, uh, and, and people say, well, what's physically demanding about getting up and speaking in front of a crowd? Tell um, them. Yeah, you, you've got to maintain your voice and that sort of thing. But one thing that's uh, like crazy, like right now, and, and you're on the, almost the same schedule, we're booked for the rest of the year up until Christmas. And, and we're both going to work around New Year's too. So 
um, the physical demand on it is flying and traveling. I mean, that really takes its toll. I mean, you're a lot younger than I am, but I notice as I get older, uh, now that I'm 60, 73, <laughs> you know, but seriously, um, it, it really is tough to fly, uh, you know, from L.A. to Europe and then just have to hit the ground running. And, you know, coming up, I was telling you this before, in December, I'm going to have one week where I literally will circle the globe for the first time and work and fly from New York to uh, Brisbane, Australia, and then the next day fly to London and after that fight fly home to Los Angeles again. So I will have circled the globe plus the same distance from New York to L.A. So it's, it's more than circle the globe all in one uh, seven-day period. We did a thing here that was like the university of buffer you know you we were the headmaster and uh, the william hill <laughs> university of buffer yeah. fair play the william yeah. hill university yeah. of michael buffer where you took uh, some of us journalists and <clears throat> excuse me see you can't even allow, you're not even allowed to do that like if you did that at your job people would be, like yeah. be tweeting about it for 17 days let's get ready <clears throat> see <clears throat> where, where was i Exactly. I mean, those little kind of things that I can appreciate having worked on the mic and I get an editor if I really blow it that can make me look a lot better than I am. None of these things are available to you. But my point is that I went through a, a very, what, 20, 30 minutes of a kind of a mock class. But what it thought, what the thought it gave me was that I don't know that that class actually exists. Like, I'm not sure if I were to want to pursue this profession and there's so few jobs to be had. Where is that university? How does one come up through whatever ranks exist to put themselves in a position to even do the job you do. Yeah, that university is the, uh, the school of uh, learning as you go along in real life. There, you know, there's no way. You know, people ask me, like, what tips can you give me? And it, it, it really is, there, you know, what can I do? I mean, I, I kind of just got my foot in the door by lying on a resume and, and you know, <laughs> Getting into a, a show on USA Cable back in the old days, 35 years ago, uh, was dreadful, and then managed to like you know get another chance uh, six months after that, and kind of took off a little bit. But um, you know what what do you, what do you really tell people? We had some fun with this, and um, there were things that I pointed out to some of the students who were just you know guys from the media, and we were all enjoying it, but. Um, you know, like don't rock back and forth when you speak. Just, just all little odds and ends, little things you can pick up on, and the order of giving the introductions and that sort of thing. But you really have to just kind of uh, have a feel for it. And uh, I, I think one of the most important things is learn how to use a PA system. You know, don't just like hold it, hold it right to your mouth like a rock, uh, like a rap artist or whatever. And, um, just a lot of little things that the people can learn, but you got to learn it on your own. You know, we were in the theater today for the press conference, and I even made a mental note of, I, you know, we've done so many of these together, I can reflect on more than I can count. And you definitely brought the tone down because the room was smaller. You're still speaking through yeah, a speaker yeah, system. You can still do your right thing. Right but I was like, huh, I noticed this. Uh, are there any little tricks like that where someone like there has to be a starter class like there has like you know what I mean what, what's the course I because I, I, every now and then someone asks me like how I, how do you become a, an announcer that seems like a cool job whatever yeah. I don't know what to tell them I can barely tell them how to be to get in this job that I'm doing it's it's kind of self-crafted no, you're, you're, you're right what are you going to tell people to ask like how can I be radio Rahim well I know you gotta you be know, a real you prick do? and then like you, just you continue just, to yeah. force people to let you in the door sure <laughs> yeah I mean you you know you had a, you started here and now you're here and and you just you worked at it. You've been doing it for years. So, is this okay? So obviously, you're a huge boxing aficionado. You're a fan. It's in your blood. Like you, regardless of your talents, you wouldn't do so many of these fights if you didn't love it the way you do. Yeah, right. Do you feel the same about announcing? Do you do you like look for the next up and coming announcer? Do you do you tune into anything just to watch the announcer perform? Um, yeah, I guess so. Sure, I, I do that. But but you know what? At the same time. I might see something that, you know, not that I want to copy someone, but I might see something that like is like, like really good. And I'll say like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll try to incorporate a version of that because, you know, that, you know, I've, I've seen that occasionally where, I, you know, I guess I can't remember what it was, but I'm, I'm sure that happened. You know, you always have to be 
prepared and, and want to do better. You're intimately aware of the production of a fight. What happens when this happens and that happens and we do this and that happens. Whereas a lot of fans, I think, before the uh, interview even began, we were talking about some things that I didn't even notice might happen while I think people were being announced and whatnot. Just the process that kind of washes over us. Is there anything, just a part of the production of boxing, that you would correct? Anything that annoys you or that you think could be done better that just nobody bothers to pay attention to? Yeah, there, there, there are things um, for years, I, forever almost, I've had an ongoing battle with certain uh, productions that think, you know, sadly, when someone passes away, we like to honor them with a 10 count, a 10 bell tribute. And I've had different productions say, okay, let's do that after the fighters come out and get in the ring. And I'm like, oh my God, please no, because the fighters are prepared to fight and the crowd is excited when they come out and you don't want to throw in a 10 bell memorial while the fighters are standing there and, and they have to like solemnly stand still when they're, they're warmed up, they want to stay. It's just disrespectful to those fighters and to the deceased who we're trying to honor. And that's just been one little thing, production-wise, that I've always like, you know, kind of had a battle with. And I've been successful most times in, in you know, preserving that little moment. So uh, that's just a little example, you know. And uh, lastly, if there was one thing that you could just wave your magic microphone and for the years and decades that will come beyond us all, as announcers come up and take the stage as we leave it, is there anything that you would say that you should do, you want done for sure from now on, and one thing that you'd never want to see again if you could stop every announcer from doing it? Okay, well, if I could wave my magic wand, I'd wave it and make myself 20 years younger, okay? <laughs> well, besides, no, it's on the 30 wishing 30 for years, more wishes. <laughs> 30 years younger, but, um, wow, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I think whatever, whoever's coming along and is going to like, you know, uh, be the, uh, the next uh, big thing or whatever you want to call it or, or just even having fun being an announcer is just, just have fun with it and just enjoy it. And don't, don't really try to copy someone else, just develop your own style and, and that sort of thing. That's all. What about, I know I said lastly, but that's part of my thing. I'm just, you know, stringing you out here. I got to keep talking because you're such a fascinating guy. I, you know, okay, so you've been doing this long enough. Obviously, you're still a very young man, but you've managed to work through many eras while re maintaining your youth. Between the times when it's just like most people are watching this stuff on TV, it's a sing like you know, that's the only way you get it. You've seen it or you didn't see it, and if you didn't see it, you got to read it on the papers, or you know, and then it comes to the VHS, and then you know, the next now, your voice, your image, your persona is everywhere, can be taken and applied to things that are well out of your control. How is it living through this, all these different mediums, and having such a unique and identifiable personality and brand and even catchphrase to control that and do you like this like kind of wild wild west where things are everywhere did you prefer it when it was just like the single television but maybe less people were able to know who you were or be familiar with your work yeah I, no I, I enjoy where everything has happened and my career has, has led me to you know and it's been you know movies and tv and commercials and um and doing the introductions at almost every championship, championship sport there is, including, you know, you, you were with me at the NBA uh, championships. It's, it's hard to beat just as a fan. I mean, you know, you and I sat in the stands after I did my thing at the beginning of the game and just loving every minute of it. So, you know, how can you beat that? I mean, you know, I'm still a sports fan and uh, especially, you know, football, baseball, boxing, and it just, you know, it's, it's hard to beat. Uh, saying there's anything I would want to change. Uh, just, I, I like it all. I love it. We get to talk about fights all the time. There's going to be, I believe it's six fights in the next seven weeks. We're going to spend most of those fights covering them together uh, while I'm covering them and you're performing as usual. So uh, one thing that fight fans don't often get the opportunity to do is to take an in-depth look at the legends in the sport, the giants, the people who really are... Uh, 
constants from all the way through, uh, at least me being a kid and people understanding what this boxing thing is all about. You're part of that reality, like that voice, that catchphrase, that face, these suits <laughs> are part of the fabric of our sport and uh, one of the many uh, orbiting planets in our universe. So I thought today would be a fine time to just delve back into what it is that makes you who you are and what it is that allows you to bring us what you do, which is excellence every time. I hope you don't so, mind not talking boxing today, but I so want to yeah, talk buffer. After that, I almost feel like I want to retire. Like, you know, wow, that was so nice. Yeah, no, it, it, it's that nice. And the beauty is that I could have done this interview 10 years ago and it would have been just as nice. And these kind of people, like the kind of work that you consistently put forward is really unmatched, man. Like, it's not something that's common. So... I felt like we had to talk about it, and I wanted to. It, this is an honest interview. We talk a lot, but some of these things I really wanted to know myself, especially after today. You took a little time to show well, us how you I, do your I craft. I honestly say this without a doubt. Uh, you know, I always watch your interviews, and sometimes we're at different parts of the world and all that, but all I have to do is go to YouTube or, you know, <laughs> and I, I see these. You've had some really good ones this year, too. Some. Uh, I'm not even going to bring us on names, but you broke some stories that were hot, you know, and, and controversies and all that, so... You know, you're right there, man. You're doing, you're doing your thing, and I, I love it. It's great. It's great stuff. I appreciate that. I'm still scrapping. I'm looking to like be as consistent as you. If I were, you know what I mean? Like, I have a long way to go to be able to say, you know what? I do it the best, and I've been doing it the best for quite some time, and not let that be an arguable point. It's not an arguable point with you, sir. Right, you are the you, master. Sir. You are the master. Thank you, sir. Professor Michael Buffer visiting upon us his great wisdom with Radio Raheem.